En avant, je voudrais remercier tous les organisateurs de ce colloque, euh, et personnellement euh, Nelly Martin et Asko Tevanchik euh, pour votre invitation. Euh, maintenant, euh, vous comprenez pourquoi c'est très important et très intéressant pour moi de participer à ce séminaire ici à Bordeaux. Mais malheureusement, mon français est très limite et c'est pourquoi J'espère que vous m'excusez si je fais ma communication en anglais. So, uh, if we jump from the first stage of um, application of GIS in archaeology, from the stage of collection, the data, rectification, uh, description that was made, uh, that was shown actually in the presentations, brilliant presentations of this first part of the colloquium here, uh, to the special analysis. Uh, usually we uh, use four main procedures of such kind of analysis for archaeological data. That is a uh, viewed analysis, uh, the analysis of visibility, the area that is visible from uh, the exact site or number of sites. That is cost distance analysis. That is analyzing uh, the efforts, the energy that we put uh, in our movement on the three-dimensional space. That is site catchment analysis, uh, the reconstruction of the resource zone in exact distance from one settlement, and thesis and tessellation. That is also reconstructing the resource zone uh, around a number of settlements that is coexisting. And I will concentrate in my presentation on the last two types of analysis. Uh, of course, you know very well, I just would like to remind you that uh, this analysis came from new geography in the late 60s to archaeology. And uh, the site catchment analysis is based on the assumption that uh, every settlement with the mm, so-called primitive economy uh, has the exact resource zone on the some distance uh, from the settlement. If we talk about the agriculture, Usually people uh, used the space in the distance of one, one and a half kilometers for arable fields. Uh, and the rest of the space is used for some supplies, supplies of wood, supplies of hay and so on. It was uh, very common and uh, there were a number of examples made before GIS came to archaeology. And for example, a very well known project uh, on the early agriculture in Europe made by Higgs and his command in the late 70s, like on this picture on the left. And uh, also there are a number of scholars, not very, very um, not many of scholars, but some of scholars in Russia that also made such kind of uh, site catchment analysis for the archaeological sites, like this picture on the right. This uh, tessellation is also a um, very well known procedure. Uh, when we are trying to reconstruct the space that was in use as a resource zone around the settlements, we usually could make uh, something like a border between two settlements in between. But this analysis has a lot of limitations. For example, for the first, uh, if we make this simple decent isolation, we usually look at the space as a two-dimensional space we do not take into account uh, the natural borders that could be inside this space. It's just something like a sheet of paper. Next, uh, we should take into account that the settlements uh, inside this map, they could be different on the size and on the importance. Like here, you can see uh, there are different types of settlements on this map on the left. There are regional centers and smaller settlements. So if we try to use such procedure, we need to make different stages of this tessellation and prepare larger zone for regional centers and lower uh, zones uh, for uh, small sites. Also, uh, you can see here very well that the border uh, of the map uh, has very large resource area that is not adequate actually just because of the analysis we do not take into account another settlement that could exist on the periphery of this picture so we need also uh, make some limitation for uh, the resource zone around the settlements 
like here, for example. So I tried to use these procedures uh, in investigation of the system of habitation of the Alanic tribes, that is Iranian-speaking tribes. It's, it's very, uh, for me, it's very interesting to be here because we know from the written sources that the Alans uh, visited Aquitania in the uh, uh, Great Migration period and they were here, exist here, but they came from the Caucasus, from the Central Caucasus. And I'm investigating the small region that is situated there in the Caucasus. That is a small valley, approximately 40 to 20 kilometers, that is situated near the modern, very famous resort, kurort place, uh, mineral water uh, place, uh, Kislovatsk. It is situated in 70 kilometers to, to the north from the highest point of Europe, the Mount of Albrus. You could see here this. Lovely, maybe you could see. <laughs> lovely, lovely mountain. And uh, for us, it was very important that the investigation of this place started around 150 years ago. And uh, it was chosen, actually, because it seemed to us uh, that it was the best investigated region in the Caucasus. We started in 1996. At that time, uh, it was something around uh, 300 archaeological sites known on this <coughs> territory. You can see these sites by red dots on this map. And in few years of our uh, archaeological survey, we doubled this quantity. And now we have around 900 archaeological objects in the Kislovodsk Basin, uh, dated from Neolithic period to the modern time. But the huge amount of this data belong to early medieval period, that is a period of my interest. So it's actually the Merovingian period. It's the 5th, 8th centuries AD here. If we look on the geological map of the region, uh, you could see that uh, this geology is very complicated. And this uh, valley is formed by the sedimentary rock uh, of different types and uh, uh, these uh, geological processes formed uh, very uh, strong borders uh, in the river valleys. So people in early medieval period, they prefer to settle on the uh, promontories like this with practically vertical uh, borders on, uh, on the bank of canyons. And they prepared the fortification, stone fortification. You could see it here, that is the rest of uh, stone walls and towers and sometimes we are very lucky to find such type of evidences on the surface very good preservation like here but uh, we are lucky not only with the architecture but also with agriculture uh, Kislovodsk Basin is famous <coughs> by the rests the traces of tea raised agriculture on this territory of very good preservation uh, and uh, when we use the simple GIS analysis, for example, site catchment analysis, uh, we, could, uh, assum uh, we could make an assumption that these uh, traces of agriculture is very suitable for the sites of uh, practically every period. For the first time, I made this simple procedure, just one kilometer border around the settlements, and I found that there are a number of terraces inside of these borders. So I thought that these terraces belong to the early medieval period. But uh, actually, we have two types of terraces here. There is a huge uh, single, double, triple, large terraces with very high banks. You could see it here. That is our expeditional lorry. That is for the scale, actually. That is a really huge agricultural traces. And another type of uh, terraces, like here, there is a long, narrow strips, very well known in uh, European agriculture. Uh, it is actually uh, strip lynchets in English, rideau, if, if I'm right, in French. Uh, so I have analyzed around 500 uh, uh, aerial photos and mapped uh, both types of agriculture and then try to associate it with the sites of different periods. And you could see here that 
this first type of terraces is very good uh, uh, associated with the settlements of late Bronze Age, early Iron Age period. Uh, we call this uh, uh, culture Kaban, Kabanian culture. That is the same actually like Hallstatt culture at the same time and very similar to the Hallstatt in uh, Central and Southern Europe. And only the first type of the terraces is associated with these settlements. But if we put the fortified early medieval sites on the same map, we could see that both type of agriculture could be in association with this both, uh, um, bo both type of terraces. So JS actually doesn't answer this question about the dating of these traces of agriculture. That is why we started our soil studies with my colleague from uh, Pushina Soil Institute, Alexander Borisov, and for several years we made around 200 trenches and drillings and we put a special attention on the ceramic shirts that we found in the trenches. Uh, I have analyzed more than 3,000 ceramic shirts uh, that could be approximately dated to the culture, not to the century of course, but to the belong to one culture or another culture. And my friend, a uh, soil specialist, found very interesting thing that practically all over the basin, practically in every trench, not only on the terraces, but on the other type of landscapes, we have a buried soil full of ceramic of late Bronze Age that is covered by quite high level of diluvium. So actually we proved that there was something like a paleoecological catastrophe uh, in the middle of the first uh, millennium BC. And people in early medieval period, when they came to this place, they couldn't use all the space for their agriculture, but only the flat territories uh, in the vicinity of the settlements, not the slopes. The slopes were covered by clay that time. So when I took these results into account, I have prepared the reconstruction of the uh, resource zones around the early medieval forti fortified settlements in the Kislovodsk Basin. Uh, I made it in several stages. For the first time, I made uh, the slope analysis, the analysis of uh, the slopes of the territories. Uh, you could see here that we have a real canyons that is marked by red, that is practically 90 degrees, practically vertical relief, and quite large space that is rather flat. I made a reclassification of this map and allocate the class of the relief that is from 0 to 10 degrees of the slopes, the flattest relief of the basin. Then I uh, made something like the masks, a uh, polygonal layer for every bank of the main rivers. Because if we make a simple site catchment analysis, we will have the resource zones on the other side of the river. For example, here, one kilometer zone will be on the one bank of the river and on another bank. But in reality, it's very difficult to get this another bank of the river. You should climb down, then climb up, and uh, it uh, takes something like one hour and a half to get the other bank of the river. So uh, I uh, made this limitation and uh, made a special analysis later with every mask on every side of the river. That is actually the result of the simple site catchment, uh, one kilometer zone around the early medieval settlements. Uh, and then I combined this layer with the layer of the flat territories. So I have allocated the flat territory around the settlement that is suitable for agriculture for early medieval period. After that, I made a thesis tessellation, uh, not the simple one, but uh, using this um, cost distance approach and made the borders between the settlement, not on the simple distance, but on the time that you need to get uh, one or another place. And when I combined this picture with the uh, suitable land for agriculture, I have modeled 
the resource zones for early medieval settlements in the Kislovsk Basin. Of course, it is a picture. It is very nice, interesting results. But the question is, could we prove these results in the field or not? Uh, we tried to do it, and uh, you could see here, for example, uh, some such uh, modeling uh, in a combination with our field data on the ceramic that was found in the test soil trenches. In the red, uh, there is a ceramic of early medieval period. You can see here that it lies actually in one kilometer zone around the fortified settlement and there is practically nothing uh, outside of this one kilometer zone. But the best example we found in the small river where we could find another type of agricultural plots, you know it very well, it is the plots of rectangular forms uh, formed by the stone walls that was collected during the farming from the uh, parcel uh, and it is known in European archaeology as Celtic fields and in France it should be Le Champ Celtic. We were very lucky to find absolutely the same uh, phenomena in the Caucasus that belong to the early medieval time. We could prove it by the ceramic finds from our trenches. And if we put this data that was made in the field, actually it was planned, uh, mapped by GPS in the field. If we put this data to this uh, reconstruction made in GIS, you could see here that it's very suitable for the uh, reconstruction of resource zone. So it means that people in early medieval period in the Kislovsk Basin, they used actually the simple art with a pair of oxes and made this crisscross plowing like in northwestern Europe at the same time. And it's quite interesting that people in the Caucasus still use something like this in the high mountains. This photo was made uh, in Dagestan last April. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>